Uh, Casper's in charge, and she's promised today to be calmer than she has been in previous situations where we're by coastal. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let loose a little bit and stop trying to be so professional. I think it's because I witnessed an hour of you talking like this to the camera and interviewing people and introducing them as, hello, Governor Jan Brewer, how are you? Like, like I see an hour of professionalism from you, and it kind of throws me off a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, me being professional. Exactly. That, 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 that'll throw off anybody. Like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> no, but I did watch today, and I saw the interview where you got a little feisty. There was a little heated debate. It was good. I liked it. You're bringing the fire to MSNBC. And I know that everyone uh, in the TYT Army likes it as well. Yeah. Somebody already tweeted out that I should have gone harder on that guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's hard to disagree. Next time. Tune in tomorrow. No, you did a good job. I liked it. All right, let's get started with some of our stories. I have a couple political stories for you guys today, and then after that, uh, we will talk about Kim Kardashian's ass in silver. Oh, yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's what we do on the Young Turks. All right, let's start with Governor Jan Brewer. If you guys could remember, um, a while ago, she had a disastrous introduction to her debate with Terry Goddard. If you don't remember it, don't worry, because we have a video. I want to show it to you guys, and then I'll explain why it's relevant today. Ted, and it's great to be here with Larry, Barry, and Terry, and thank you all for watching us tonight. I have uh, done so much, and I just cannot believe that we have changed everything since I become your governor in the last 600 days. Arizona has been brought back from its abyss. We have cut the budget, we have balanced the budget, and we are moving forward. We have done everything that we could possibly do. Fail. <laughs> Awkward. We have... Um, Disaster. ...did what was right for Arizona. I will tell you that I have really did the very best that anyone could do. We have pushed back hard against the federal government. We have filed suit against Obama Health Care, and, and we have passed Senate Bill 1070, and we will continue to do what's right for Arizona. I ask for your vote. Thank you. All right. Very good. All right. So even though that disastrous introduction happened a while ago, people are still trying to come up with excuses for why she did so poorly. And what's interesting is now there are rumors flying around that she could possibly have a serious illness. In fact, some people are claiming that she could possibly have Alzheimer's disease. And one person who's claiming that is uh, a PhD, Stuart Fishoff, and he wrote a blog for uh, Psychology Today. And he claims that, uh, first of all, she, it made no sense that she messed up on that introduction because she had it right in front of her. So it's not like she had to memorize it. She had it in front of her. She could have read it. But it seemed like she was completely frazzled. She didn't realize where she was or what she was doing. So he's claiming that she could possibly have Alzheimer's disease. And then John Doherty, who is uh, an investigative journalist, he also tweeted that Jan Brewer is severely ill and the news story will come out soon. But, but what does that mean? Like, why are we making excuses for her? She got frazzled. She sucked at the introduction. Yeah, it was in front of her, but she tried to memorize some of it, and then she lost her place. She looked down at the paper, couldn't find her place, and then she mumbled some mumbo-jumbo and then moved on. Like, where did Alzheimer's disease come from? Well, you know, I don't know if that helps her or hurts her. Are, there, are these people on our side or against her? Because if she has Alzheimer's, do we want her as governor? I mean, I don't want to hate, but at the same time, that might be an issue. If she's like, and I'd like to represent the great state of New Mexico. I mean, Taiwan. I mean, Alaska. <laughs> no, you're, you know, you're so, absolutely oh, right. A lot of people are saying that, you know, if she does have some sort of illness, then she needs to come forward and let people know about it because that really compromises her ability to be an effective governor of Arizona. Yeah, and by the way, I'm, I'm not buying the Alzheimer's argument. Uh, and I, I think it hurts her, honestly. I, I don't think that that's uh, something she wants out there. But the reason I'm not buying it is she remembered everybody's name. And I know it could be early on, et cetera, but she's like, you know, thank you, Larry, Barry, and Harry. And, and you know, she had everything else down until she went, like, postal and was like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a million uh, things could have happened. She could have gotten nervous. She could have lost her place and her uh, 
predetermined speech. So many things could have happened. So I don't even know where this Alzheimer's claim came from. I don't even know where people are getting the idea that she's ill. But as you mentioned, yeah, it, I think it definitely does hurt her because people are now saying if she's sick, then she needs to step down because we don't want her leading our state. Yeah, I don't know. That's kind of a heavy charge. Uh, I, I think, I think. look, you don't want her leading the state because she doesn't know what she would do with the state. She's like, here's what I would do with the state. Uh, I, I, I have, I've been really good. I'm an excellent governor. <laughs> like, I mean, the panic in her face is like enough to be like, hey, you know what? I'm not sure I need somebody panicking like that in office. Right. No, absolutely agree. And my favorite part about it is the nervous laugh where she doesn't know what she's going to say next. So she looks down and laughs to herself. It's such an awkward video. I love it. All right. Well, <laughs> can I can I do more of Jan Brewer? I like this. <laughs> so you're right. I did incorporate the laugh, nervous laugh into it. First, I'd like to thank Larry, Larry, and Larry, and then I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm awesome. <laughs> Elect me. <laughs> Panic. Oh my uh, gosh. All right. Speaking of awkward videos, uh, JR has managed to find us some more awkward footage of Alvin Green. Um, he was talking to Lawrence O'Donnell and he talks about how Jim DeMint started the recession and he also uh, talks about other Jim DeMint stances. Let's start with video number two. Joining me now, the Democratic nominee for Senate from South Carolina, Alvin Green. Alvin Green, thanks for joining us tonight. Good evening. There's a first question uh, that all Senate candidates have to answer this year, and that is, of course, are you a witch? <laughs> no, first I want to remind everyone that DeMint started the recession. <laughs> what? There you go. You're on your talking yeah. points, not a witch, and DeMint started the recession. <laughs> all right. Uh, now, your nickname in high school, I'm told, was Turtle. Does that tell us, and where did that come from, and does that tell us anything about how this race might end up? Well, DeMint started the recession. DeMint is responsible for the <laughs> recession. And I'm the best candidate that defines where we're at right now in this country. Um, now, I know people tell you, you know, no matter what the That's question right. is, just do your talking points and all that sort of stuff. But seriously, Alvin, your nickname, Turtle, um, where did that come from? No. No? Like I said, okay. DeMint started the recession, and <laughs> I'm the best candidate def that defines where we're at in this country. I'm a United States Air Force, a United States Army veteran. Uh, you know, the concentrations on those efforts, and, and um, an unemployed military veteran currently, and, and we're losing, this country is losing 100,000 jobs a month, and, and DeMint is responsible for the recession, DeMint, DeMint started the recession. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh my God, that's so wonderfully awkward. That was the weirdest video clip I've ever seen. So he completely ignores the question, which makes me wonder, was he hearing the questions? Like, did <laughs> no, he... no, no, Alvin's on another planet, man. He was hearing the questions because he stopped at the right times, answered at the right times. He just <laughs> didn't give the right answers. He's like, so how do you uh, respond to the charge that you have hemorrhoids? Um, <laughs> DeMint started the recession. <laughs> no, that Is was true so that you're from the planet Uranus? <laughs> well, my thoughts on that are that that damn DeMint started the recession, man. He really did. Yeah, and I was really looking forward to finding out why people called him Turtle back in the day, but I guess we're never going to find out because he's uh, very much interested in talking about how DeMint supposedly started the recession. I, I think we should get him on the show to ask him if DeMint started the recession. <laughs> and then ask him why, because I'd love to hear how <laughs> DeMint started the recession. All right, we, we fortunately have another video um, of the interview, and let's go to that, video number three. What, let's go to some DeMint positions and see, you know, if, uh, how you differ with him. Do you think that single mothers should be allowed to be school teachers in South Carolina? Yes. That's their private life, and um, as long as their private life doesn't interfere with how they do their job, that's, so, so that's fine. I mean, it's, 
um, what they do in their private life, um, you know, as long as it doesn't have any uh, effect on how they do their job. So that's 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 fine, and it's just poor positions from um, Dement uh, that that has gotten to us into this recession. So we just have to keep that in mind that Dement <laughs> started the recession. And how did and, how did Dement personally start the recession? <laughs> Irresponsible spending, um, um, record cuts to education, um, the um, supporting the um, Bush tax plan, and, then, then uh, um, mismanagement of federal resources. Um, and, you know, we can look at um, the wars in the Middle East and um, just how the, um, the wars are managed um, in Iraq and in Afghanistan and um, so we just see this irresponsible spending and this mismanagement of government resources federal government resources and just mismanagement of resources it's it's destroyed this country and we see that he's responsible for it and that's fact Dement started the recession he's responsible for the recession and it doesn't make any sense sending someone back to Washington to just messing things up every day well, I got to tell you, I don't think Jim DeMint personally started the recession, but I do think Alvin Green still better than Jim DeMint. Alvin Green, Democratic oh, candidate sent for Senate for South Carolina, <laughs> thanks for joining us tonight. Okay, he started it in his first term. All right. Yes, well, Senate. All right, thank get you. Get out there and make your All right, case. Research thing. it, research, do the research. I will, I will do the research yeah, right after fact. the show. I'll find yes. out who started it. Find out how he voted. Okay. Against, yes. Thank All right. you very much, you Alvin Green. Oh my God. <laughs> Look, I I'm starting to feel bad for him, right? Because, I mean, this is craziness. He didn't win that election. I mean, I've said this before. I'll double down, I'll triple down. Th there's no way in the world that guy got over 60% of the vote in the Democratic primary. That thing was as rigged as uh, you could possibly imagine. And now they're putting this poor guy out there that's obviously not prepared. He's sometimes crossing up Republican and Democratic talking points. He's trying to deliver one by one. The, the sad thing is, he's right. And Jim DeMint is terrible for the country, and he was part of the folks who had the policies that started the recession. But you can't, you can't do this, man. I mean, it, this is this is madness. No, I I agree 100%. Like halfway through that, I felt the same way. I need to stop laughing at this guy because he's in a really bad position. If I were him, I would say no to every interview. Like, there's no way I would go on Lawrence O'Donnell's show. There's no way I would try to have a serious conversation about political policies or the economy or anything like that. I don't understand why he would agree to it, because he obviously has no idea what he's talking about. And JR you know has... What? JR, hey, you know what? Uh -huh. he, didn't, he didn't do any campaigning in the primary. He doesn't have a dollar to his name. He's unemployed. He lives in his dad's house. He's so... If it worked for him in the primary, maybe you get the same Alvin Green magic, get some little uh, turtle magic going on in the general election, just shows up, doesn't spend a dollar, boom. Next senator from South Carolina, Alvin the Turtle Green. Well, that's the thing. See, see a couple of things. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, obviously, but, you know, the, the really one of the main things is, is I don't know, I think he's, I've, I think we mentioned it before. There's no way he won that normally. And then I think he got some assistance or some kind of nudging or something was set up from the Republican side of, of the aisle on this. They want this clown out there to do this. Mm -hmm. And number two, we did find out why his nickname was Turtle. He's slow. It's, it's, I don't know. I'm not talking bad about him. He has some things wrong in his brain. Something maybe happened to him when he was in the military. I don't know what things he may have gone through or seen, whether it's anything he saw, combat or training, any of that stuff. The guy's got something wrong with his brain. He does. Look, I, I will agree with that because I feel like he has a really difficult time with social cues. Like, for instance, when uh, O'Donnell was trying to finish that interview, was trying to wrap it up, instead of letting him wrap it up, he came back again with Jim DeMint started the recession. Yes, we know. You had an opportunity to explain why. Like, he didn't understand that social cue. So, yeah, there's something a little off about him. And I feel bad because, you know, it's easy to sit here and laugh at him, but... Think about the position he's in. I mean, as someone who does a show every day, someone who's on air every day, I can imagine being insanely nervous being on, like, Chris O'Donnell's show or on uh, cable television. Imagine how bad it is for somebody who's been named Turtle his entire life. 
Yeah, and by the way, being on L.A. Uh, CSI would be really uh, nerve-wracking. Or if you were on Lawrence O'Donnell's show on MSNBC, either way it would be nerve-wracking. <laughs> oh, okay, oh. I'm going to stop being a wise-ass. And uh, oh, Actually, I'm not going to stop. One more thing. How awesome would a Jan Brewer-Alvin Green debate be? That would be the best debate in the world. <laughs> and Come on. Sarah Palin, you tell me you wouldn't watch? Sarah I'd Palin, watch. Sarah Palin could be the moderator. How awesome would that be? You know, Sarah Palin's the one who came up with that in the first place. Remember when during, during the vice presidential uh, debate, she told the moderator, I will not be answering your questions. Okay. <laughs> you know, because they're, they're from the lamestream media. She didn't say lamestream media in the debate. But okay. she said, I, I don't care to answer your questions. I'm just going to read my talking point. Right. She was her own moderator. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. So maybe that's where Turtle got her from. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we have a story about Ken Buck and how he's in hot water for the way he handled a rape case back when he was a district attorney. We'll be back on The Young Turks. It's hard, never give up, baby don't cry Don't get your head up, even when the road is hard, never give up Welcome back to The Young Turks, Anna Kasparian and Jenk Uger with you Alright, let's get to France's uh, prime, not prime minister France's finance minister, her name is Christine Lagarde And uh, she recently did an interview where she claimed that Females make better politicians than males do because they are not prisoners of testosterone and libido. All right. She says that it's probably overgeneralized, but she sh and she's also sure that there are women who operate in a similar way. But in the main, I honestly believe that the majority of women in such positions approach power in a slightly different manner. So what I find interesting about this is, all right, so women maybe don't have to deal with testosterone in the same way that men do, but women have estrogen. And women go through that time of the month. And women have hormones and emotions and uh, moments of irrational behavior all the time. So it's a crazy statement to make. Well, you know, I, I like that she's flipping the stereotype on its head. Right. You know, because that stereotype has existed for so long, you can't trust women because they're so irrational, you know, around that time of the month or whatever. And she's like, well, so what? Men are irrational all the time. Right. <laughs> you know, and it's a fair and interesting point. Look, and I, of course, that men and women should not be eliminated from uh, holding government positions or leadership positions. That's obviously absurd on its face. But I do wonder how it would be in a world ruled by women. Would we really have as many wars? Maybe, maybe not. No, I think we'd have a much more uh, peaceful world. I think it'd be better. I think that uh, this finance minister has a point. You know, less testosterone means less war. Yeah, maybe. I, look, I don't think it's that crazy. Women, men, and women are different, right? Right. And and so that and look, for example, uh, look at the jails, right? The jails are filled to the rim with men. Mm -hmm. uh, they commit more crime. They commit more violent crime. Men are more violent. I mean, I'm, it doesn't mean they should be disqualified. I'm a man. I don't want to be disqualified from leadership. Mm -hmm. But and, and of course, you can't make blanket statements. But. It's something to consider. I mean, it's an interesting uh, point to, to think about. Right. And what's also interesting is I'm wondering whether or not she's pointing a finger to um, President Sarkozy because uh, he's been known to, you know, have high testosterone levels. <laughs> and he, <laughs> you know, I actually... But at I, least, I, I, don't know. I, I don't think he started a war, though, so you got to give him that. Yeah. <laughs> He just, you know, will keep Queen Elizabeth waiting as he's having sex with his wife, w which is a rumor. It's not true. We don't know if it's true. It could be true. <laughs> get it, get it. Get it, get it. All right. A new study indicates uh, that 16% of men in an extramarital affair uh, would rather pass up a new car instead of uh, passing up nights with his mistress. Hmm. Yeah. Is is there more specifics? I mean, it depends on the car and it depends on the mistress. I mean, the mistress is Rosary Dawson and the car's, uh, I don't know, a Pontiac Grand Am like mine. Uh, you know, if the mistress is Schwang Wang Wang and the car's uh, Beamer or something, then we're having a different conversation. What if it's Rosario Dawson and the car's a Beamer? Look, man, I, I ain't that rich. I'll, I'm going to take the Beamer, okay? If I was richer and I didn't give a damn, then maybe I'd take Rosario. <laughs> Right. 15% uh, say that they would rather sacrifice their 
football season ticket instead of give up uh, nights with their mistress. What do you think about that, Jake? Yeah, now we're having a conversation. Now, that's a little bit more reasonable. Like, I, it hurts me to miss football, but for Rosario, uh, football, what name so? Oh, really? So you would miss football to be with Rosario? Yeah, isn't that sick? You know, it, like, by the way, of course, I wouldn't cheat. La, 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 la. We know all that, right? Mm -hmm. But for men, if you're with your wife, that's not, I mean, we've done studies like that before on the show. We've uh, shown them to you. They're not that motivated to do anything. They're like, ah, you know, sure. I wouldn't really give up doing my math homework for that. I don't know if you should be doing math homework if you're married. But anyway, uh, but if it's a mistress, they're like, what do I need to give up? What do I, yeah, football, yeah, who cares? Which they would never give up for their wives. I mean, it's really sick in a lot of ways. No, it is sick in a lot of ways. And the reason why this study was done, by the way, it was a survey by illicitencounters.com. Um, the reason why it was done is because they wanted to show how men who have mistresses have psychological similarities to men who have gambling problems because they're almost addicted to that mistress, you know? to the point where they're willing to give up anything and everything for her. And the, I find that interesting because if you're that infatuated with your mistress, why don't you let your wife know and move the hell on? I, I know it's easier said than done, but if you have this crazy addiction to another woman, why are you going to string your wife along while you're having sex with someone else on the side? A am I being naive in saying that? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> it's just not that simple. And of course, they want both. They want the good family life. They want their kids. Uh, but they're, you know, according to this theory, at least, addicted to their mistress. And think about what they would give up for their mistress. And, and that's why this theory has validity. Look, they're risking their whole family for the mistress. So would they give up football tickets or maybe even a car? Yeah, if they'd give up their whole life for her, I guess they would. Which that, that's why it doesn't make any sense to me to have a mistress. That's crazy talk. But some people, they just get addicted to that uh, tank. Well, that's the thing, Jake. You waited till you were 48 years old to get married. So the thing is, is people rush into, it, yeah, not 48, but I'm just letting you. Um, people <laughs> rush into marriage so much because there's this, the people, I, they have this pressure to get married. Oh, my God, I'm 24. I have to get married or else I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to wrinkle up and I'm going to die. I'm going to turn wait, into, wait. into dust. Is 24 the age you're supposed to get married? <laughs> Okay, now I'm, I'm just saying. No, I'm just I'm saying. Go no, because no, we just have this. There's a societal fact that you have to get married. Oh my God, you're not married yet. What's wrong with you? You don't have any kids. What's going on? Parents and just society in general. Women more so. So then they got to find a dude to marry him. And people aren't happily married because they just jump into it. It doesn't make any sense. Then after that, they're like, Oh my God, I met somebody that I actually like better than my wife that I kind of liked when I married her. And then now they're stuck because now they kind of like this chick they're married to, mm -hmm. but they're like, I can't hurt her, so they just cheat on them. <laughs> How stupid does that sound? Yeah. Yeah, but it happens all the time. Yeah, no question. But then the other part of it is sometimes, like, guys, I think the study has, you know, a, a decent amount of validity. Because I know some guys who just get hooked, man, and they just can't stop it with their mistress no matter how nonsensical it is, no matter how crazy it is. Yeah. You know, whenever you're considering marriage, guys, just think about the fact that you're going to be with that person for the rest of your lives. Like, what JR just told me right now scared me, because it's true. Like, if you get married in your 20s, in your early 20s, you're going to be with that person until you're, like, 89. That is some scary shit. Like, <laughs> no, that scares the crap out of me. So just think twice before you get married in your early 20s. Look further than how hot is this girl. Oh, my God, she's so hot. Oh, my God, we, we hooked up, and we've known each other for a year, and the sex is great. Let's get married. And then next, you know, you hate this person after five years. Like, you know, I really don't, I don't like who you are. Right. And How can people don't figure that out? Not only that, the worst is when you're trying to make this relationship work that you're not 100% happy with anyway. And then you meet someone that you wish you could have married. Oh, that, oh, that's such a sad life. No, I don't, never getting married. Done. This story changed my <laughs> whole perspective on marriage. <laughs> All right. We, I, I like, mm -hmm. I, I like how Anna works out her own personal issues on the show. <laughs> Marriage is a scary thing. All right. But uh, I'll tell you what, JR is actually right about me. I mean, getting married at the age of 88 uh, proved to be uh, the good mood for me because, look, I was, I, you know, guys always want more. Don't get me wrong. I definitely wanted more, too. Okay. But I was at a point where, you know, I had, I dated around a lot and, and, and the other thing is not just that I had my fill or whatever, it's that I knew what I was looking for. I, I knew what I wanted and, and what I didn't want. Mm -hmm. And that comes through experience, too. Right. All right. We can't end the show without doing the Kim Kardashian story. 
if you guys can remember, uh, a couple months ago, she said that she regret doing Playboy. She said that she was pressured into doing the photo shoot because her mom convinced her that it would be a good idea. Well, after that, she posed nude for Harper's B Bazaar, right? And we, everyone was like, ah, look at that hypocrite, look at that hypocrite. Well, she's posed naked again for W Magazine. This time, uh, she is covered in silver paint and in some of the pictures, you see a little nip-nip. In other pictures, you see her butt. Okay. She went naked again. Huh, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> of course! Of course she went naked again. And she'll do it again and again and again to get more and more interest. Now, by the way, she'll say in a, a couple of months, you know, I, I regret painting my body silver and showing the nip-nip. Uh, but, by the way, here's my new nude pictures where I'm covered in, you know, whatever she's covered in this time. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of sick of this publicity strategy, okay? First, oh, there's Kim Kardashian who says, I regret taking these naked pictures, but oh, here are some, some more for you guys. And then there's Bristol Palin, who in the very beginning of Dancing with the Stars said, I'm going to be the most modest dressed person on the entire show. And then a couple weeks later, she says, Oh, for my next dance, I'm going to dress sexy because it's a sexy dance, and that's just what I have to do. Like, no, but, but wait a minute, Anna, you missed it. Mm -hmm. She had to do it. She had it to do it. It was a sexy dance. It was a sexy what dance. What do you want from her? <laughs> oh, God. So, yeah, this is just, I, I think, publicity 101. Making a big to-do about something that you're known for and then going off and doing the same thing again. Kim Kardashian wants to be taken seriously, except she became famous for a porn tape and then Playboy, and then Harper's Bazaar, and then W. Like, we've seen your twat already, we've seen your breasts, like, let's get over it. Like, do something new. But that's the thing, Kim Kardashian can't do anything new because this is what she's known for. So Yeah, and I mean, what's she gonna do, write a book? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I mean... yes, I, I definitely think she's gonna write a book sometime in the future, a memoir. Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Kim Kardashian and my breasts, a memoir, right? <laughs> Uh, but look, on the other hand, uh, Anna, everybody's a winner, man. Uh, you know, guys want to see her naked. She wants to get more publicity. It's a fair trade. Everybody wins. All right, all right. Uh, I can live with that. Let's do one more story, uh, and this is probably my favorite story of the day. An artist by the name of Sally Davis photographed a McDonald's Happy Meal every single day for six months. What she found was shocking. The Happy Meal... <laughs> <laughs> the Happy Meal never decomposed. It's crazy. So we're looking at pictures right now. That's in the beginning of the process, day one. That's day 171. It looks exactly the same. The fries are a little shriveled up, but for the most part, it didn't decompose. You don't see any mold on the bread. You don't see any nastiness growing on the beef. That's a little creepy. You know what, though? <laughs> It's almost a testament to McDonald's, though. I mean, their, their shit stands up. You know what I'm saying? Like, it ain't going anywhere. It's still right there. You can eat it on day 272. Yeah, but it also could mean that there are so many disgusting preservatives in their food that it that's not good for you. That that's Yeah, not yeah. Food. If you're going to be a downer about it, I mean, look, they put together a quality product. That's as solid as a rock, and you guys are still complaining. <laughs> By the way, this lady's got to get a new hobby, man. <laughs> Six years of taking pictures of a Happy Meal. Jesus, Lord, mercy. Go grab a cup of coffee, man. Jog around the block. Play some kickball. Oh, God. I know, I know. But, you know, she's an artist in Manhattan. This is her work, so. She's an artiste? She's an artiste. So uh, don't when, when, when I asked about why she did it, uh, she, I hear that she said it's because Jim Timmons started the recession. <laughs> All right. We'll end on that. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Jank will be on MSNBC Live again tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern time, so make sure you guys catch it. And uh, Michael Shore will be in today at 8 p.m. Eastern time for some fun interviews and some more political news, so make sure to catch that as well. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again tomorrow on The Young Turks.